The Periplus, part two. We found that we couldn't pin down a definition of this naval tactic, despite the consensus in printed materials that a Periplus was a flanking movement by one fleet against another. A series of questions were raised. Was it an outflanking or envelopment? Was it a single ship or a unit manoeuvre? Was it an everyday manoeuvre or a specific attacking tactic for battle? Was it a complement or counter to the Dieck Plus? Can we arrive at some kind of definition for what a Periplus was? We'll address each of these points and see if we can get a better model of what a Periplus was in terms of a war galley battle tactic. Was the Periplus an outflanking or enveloping manoeuvre? This is not the same as saying one fleet sails around another as when one side forms a defensive circle, which was the situation at Artemisian and in the Gulf of Patrai. These encircling situations are not Periplus. Literally speaking, they are sailing around events, but because one side circumnavigates the other, there is no special tactic in the sailing around. Rather, this is forced onto one side because the other has taken a special tactic, which is forming a circle, a circle with no flanks to exploit. To examine the outflanking meaning of Periplus, we have two excellent examples. The penultimate sea battle in the Great Harbour at Syracuse in 413 BC, and we also have the Battle of Cunosima in 411 BC. At the Great Harbour battle, the Athenian right, led by their commander Eurymedon, sailed out to try and get around the shorter Syracusan battle line. Unfortunately, the Athenian centre was broken and repulsed before the manoeuvre was completed, and Eurymedon's division was met by the victorious Syracusan centre and pushed back against the shore. Diodorus Siculus uses the Greek word periplion, meaning sailing around, in its literal sense of sailing around in the description here. He says Eurymedon was engaged in sailing around the flank, or wing, or horn, of the enemy line. Diodorus Siculus uses the word periplion here in the literal sense because he says the Athenians sailed round the horn, which is the ancient term for the flank of a formation. If the term meant only an outflanking move, that is, if it was a naval military term, it would be unnecessary to include the term for flank. This would be redundant, like saying outflanking the flank. Periplus here, then, does not mean an outflanking move. Thucydides' account of the same action is concise and leaves no doubt as to the tactical situation. Eurymedon was attempting to outflank the Syracusans on their left. He failed and was killed. The pen of Thucydides fails to put down Periplus or even Peripline in this context. The only possible conclusion is that he didn't think this action was anything to do with Periplus, so he doesn't use the term. Then we have the Battle of Cunosima. Thucydides' account of the Battle of Cunosima is in Book 8, Section 99, and following on from there. At Cunosima, the Spartan fleet had a superiority of ten ships, and sought to use their fastest ships in an outflanking movement round the Athenian right, as the Athenian centre was hindered by the headland of Cunosima to their rear. They possibly hoped to hem the whole fleet in against the promontory, but they did not manage to do this. Thucydides explains this plan carefully, so he obviously had a good source for his account. There's no doubt the Spartan plan was to come round the flank of the Athenians to block any retreat. However, the Athenians, with their superior seamanship, made a counter-outflanking movement, which succeeded in derailing the Spartan plan. In this short passage, Thucydides is describing no less than two outflanking manoeuvres by part of each fleet. For us, the interesting thing is that the word periplus is completely absent from his description. He uses extend their line rather than periplus in the case of the Spartans, which one would assume 
was the appropriate naval tactical term if one followed most modern printed works dealing with ancient naval warfare. He also uses sailing out against for sailing beyond the enemy outflanking force for the Athenian. For some reason Thucydides, the Strategos and Triarch, the military seaman of Athens at the height of the age of the Triares, proponent of skillful rather than brutal naval tactics, somehow he fails to see the relevance of the term periplus here. Notice that both of these examples take place in restricted sea room within the channel at the Hellespont, which is only 2,000 metres wide, and within the great harbour of Syracuse, which has a maximum breadth of about two kilometres, both spaces packed with nearly 200 war galleys. This is compared with the open sea room Thucydides says is required for exercising the true art of naval warfare. I say, chaps, something is wrong with our bloody ideas today. Having somewhat scuppered the concept of Periplus as a flanking attack, let's see if we can say if it's a single ship or a fleet tactic. John Morrison produced an extensive argument for fleets manoeuvring in subunits, and in his model for war galley tactics, the Periplus would be executed by one or more subunits of the fleet moving in file. He considered the Battle of Argonusae to be a good example of this from the ancient sources. The fleet approaches in a series of files, and each file can make a decision as to where and when it attacks, he supposes. Those on the flank, or facing a gap between enemy divisions, can make a periplus attack. The file wends its way through or around the enemy and then attacks from the rear. In my opinion, this is overly naive because it relies on perfect control of each squadron in the file. Just imagine what happens if the lead ship in each squadron in file is rammed. Just imagine if the enemy is also in a series of files, or if the enemy is in two or more lines. What about the nice line of broadside targets the file presents as it cruises past the enemy? A traffic jam resulting from the head of a file being stopped is easy to imagine. Also, for his Argonuse example, Morrison assumed a fleet divided into squadrons of 15 ships, which is totally arbitrary, and 10 is a more likely figure after most accounts, if a fleet is to be so divided. He uses 15 solely to match the two fleets' frontages. This also indicates a weakness in his model. The final nail for me in the coffin of this idea was criticism of Morrison's translation. The term he translates as file, epimeus. Many Greek scholars would translate this as line. After so much support from the modern authors, starting with Admiral Rogers, down to academic scholars, the unit-level interpretation of Periplus finally got a broadside delivered against it. From ramming, rather than gunnery, one might say. The single ship model for the Periplus tactic was put forward by Ian Whitehead, who considered the action outside now Pactos to be the best example of Periplus we have from the ancient sources. Here are his diagrams. A pursuing ship is rammed and sunk by the vessel it is pursuing. The odd thing about this was that Woodhead couldn't find the use of the term Periplus in any useful examples, but he argued that other terms synonymous with Periplus were apt to be used. Therefore, the absence of the term Periplus was nothing to be worried about. The sailing around element might be thought to involve sailing around the moored freighter, but Whitehead considers this only incidental. The key to the manoeuvre is the turning around onto an opposing course which collides with the pursuing ship. This example hinges on one ship defeating a single opponent. No groups or units of ships are coordinated to achieve anything. This opens up a discussion on the anastrophe, but We'll have to save that for another poop cast. Can we find any other persuasive arguments that Periplus was a manoeuvre done by individual ships? I think we can. 
To do this, we must look at the best examples where ancient naval tactics are described, the rare examples where both Dieck Plus and Periplus feature. Dieck Plus is another battle tactic of war galleys which we will discuss in detail in a future podcast. Periplus is mentioned along with Dieck Plus by Xenophon as he describes the Battle of Arginusa in 406 BC. The Athenian fleet at Arginusa was a miracle of improvisation. They had lost most of their ships and most of the remainder was blockaded in Mussolini. They raised a relief fleet of second-rate hulls and with a ragbag of rowing crew. Such a fleet was unlikely to be as proficient as the well-paid, well-trained and aggressive Peloponnesian fleet. As the Spartan fleet comes up to form a battle line, Xenophon tells us that because the crews were better, it was the Spartans who would get the chance to execute either Diakplus or Periplus. We have already dealt with the idea of a fleet entering battle in files as unlikely, so here we must have a single line of ships all individually ready for either tactic. This is in contrast to the Athenian fleet, which is exceptionally drawn up too deep and with the coast to their rear. Both things done to counter the Spartans' use of the two usual tactics, because the Athenians knew they were the underdogs at this confrontation. This example is thus in favour of the individual Periplus. Each Spartan ship was ready to execute either Periplus or Diekplus. The Great Harbour of Syracuse Next we examine the situation in the Great Harbour. The more numerous but less expert Syracusans faced an Athenian fleet suffering from attrition, degraded ships and hemmed into the harbour. The main tactic for the Syracusans is to deny the Athenians a chance to use their superior seamanship. Thucydides tells us that the Syracusans reinforced the bows of their ships and that the battle being in the great harbour with a great many ships in not much room was also a fact in the Syracusans' favour. Charging prow to prow, they would stave in the enemy's bows by striking with solid and stout beaks against hollow and weak ones. And, secondly, the Athenians, for want of room, would be unable to use their favourite manoeuvres of breaking the line or of sailing around, as the Syracusans would do their best not to let them do the one, and want of room would prevent them from doing the other. Periplus evidently requires space to execute properly. If we form the Athenian ships into files ready for unit-based action, the concept rapidly makes even less sense. 75 Athenian ships would provide a frontage of just 5 files of 15, or maybe 8 files of 10-ish. 10 ships make a file about 500 metres long. These would be ranged against 80 Syracusan ships, each file header would then meet 12 enemy if the Syracusans deployed in line. Files of 15 or even 10 ships would have difficulty forming up within the limited sea room available to the Athenians, never mind getting through the Syracusan line, whose ships were ready to ram bow on bow with their special modification. When the second day of the penultimate battle in the Great Harbour commenced, the Athenian commander, Nicias, had made provision for any Athenian vessels forced out of the fight to take refuge between moored freighters. An entire unit of Trieres simultaneously retiring from the fight is not considered. The idea was for individual ships to be able to seek refuge. Nicias expected another attack. He therefore compelled the Trierarchs to repair their ships wherever they were injured and anchored merchant vessels in front of the palisades which the Athenians had driven into the sea so as to form a kind of dock for the protection of their own ships. These, the merchant ships, he placed at a distance of about two plethora, or 200 Athenian feet, from one another, in order that any ship which was hard-pressed might have a safe retreat and an opportunity of going out again at leisure. Thucydides' narrative describes battle lines and individual ships. There is no mention of any kind of subunit or grouping. In my humble opinion, as they say, 
Both these examples argue for individual ships being the key to war galley battles. So now we're on to point three. Was the periplus an everyday manoeuvre or a specific attacking tactic for battle? Words related to periplus occur in various forms in different ancient sources. We've got the specific episode of sailing around. We've got a well-travelled sailor. That is a related word. Someone who's sailed around a lot. Sailing around in general. Sailing around a specific object. Sailing around in small boats, as in the Great Harbour in Syracuse. No explanation is ever given by the historians, even when they're military men and they use the word in context of a battle, even when they bother to use analogies to explain other terms, such as anastrophe and how to draw up battle lines. It can be concluded that the military meaning didn't differ significantly from the everyday meaning there was nothing missing from the literal understanding of the term that a layman with some knowledge of seafaring, i.e. any Greek virtually in the age of the Triaries, would not understand. Ergo, a periplus was an indirect, roundabout course sailed by a ship for tactical purposes during a battle. The ability of a good ship to execute such manoeuvres seems to have been a given. This is hardly a revelation. It requires no sophistry or sleight of hand or novel translation or digging up of new manuscripts to assume that periplus means literally what it means, i.e. sailing around. In other words, our target has probably been hiding in plain sight. On to point four. Was periplus a complement or counter to the diec plus? If so, our knowledge of one could shed light on the other. So we could examine cases where fleets were carefully drilled for excellence in battle and see if the periplus is featured in them. There are two good examples from ancient texts. The Ionian fleet being trained before the Battle of Lade in Herodotus and the example of how Iphicrates trained his fleet before coming to the relief of Kerkura in Xenophon's Hellenica. Herodotus' account in Book 6, Part 11, deals with the tragicomic account of the second known episode of industrial action in history. The Ionian Greeks had rebelled from the Achaemenian Empire in 498 BC, and they were expecting a strike back from the empire. They engaged the expert naval commander Dionysius of Samos. Dionysius insisted the fleet trained hard every day, to the point at which they withdrew their labour, complaining they had not offended any gods to their knowledge and therefore did not deserve such punishment. Herodotus is specific that they exercised in the execution of the Diec Plus, but he does not mention the Periplus. In his account of the subsequent battle at Lade in 494 BC, Herodotus praises the Chian contingent for successfully executing Diec Plus many times against the Persian battle line, but again without mentioning Periplus. Xenophon was a fan of the Athenian general Iphicrates, who led an Athenian expedition to relieve Kerkura in 373 BC. To get there, he had to sail right round the Peloponnese, and this whole expedition voyage is, funnily enough, called a Periplus by Xenophon. Because, yes, he sailed around something. On the way, Iphicrates trained his men thoroughly for an expected sea battle. Xenophon details the training and never uses the terms Periplus, Diecplus or even Anastrophe. He is, however, careful to say that the ships were trained to become very swift at moving in file, changing into and out of line, and at turning about accelerating and reacting to signals. All these manoeuvres were obviously vital for efficiency in battle, but Xenophon gives us no specific detail on a tactic called periplus. A general high degree of discipline, competition and efficiency was inculcated in his crews by Iphicrates, but no special tactics are mentioned, 
The key to success in battle was obviously having better Trieres crews than the opponent, not some special tactic to be played like an ace in the hole. Unfortunately, we can't learn from any juxtapositions, contrasts or comparisons that the ancient authors never give us. Well, if you've managed to stick with me so far, well done. You've almost completed a veritable investigative periplus on my mental high seas. Now, we're on to the final point. Can we arrive at a definition for periplus as a naval tactic? It would seem periplus is the action of a single ship, an action which could be better executed by better ships. It involves the use of an indirect course in battle, and it's action which requires a degree of sea room. This is so simple it seems insufficient. After so much has been written in the direction of Periplus being the action of a coordinated squadron of war galleys, after so little has been written to contradict the idea of Periplus being an outflanking manoeuvre. The major hurdle to accepting this simple deduction is a lack of appreciation of the fundamental nature of war galley combat. To make clear just how important this fundamental capability was for war galley combat, we should appreciate why turning and manoeuvring would be so important in such a battle. There are three sets of information which can inform us. The nature of ship-on-ship -ship ramming combat, the turning capabilities of the Trieres Olympias, and comments from ancient sources with relation to ramming attacks. The next part of the Periplus saga will address these subjects.